Okay, so we're going to cap um, cover chapter 9 here about cellular respiration and fermentation. Okay, so chemical energy in food. Food provides, obviously, living things with certain chemi with chemical building blocks they need to grow and reproduce. Um, food molecules contain chemical energy that is released when its chemical bonds are broken. So you always are going to release energy whenever chemical bonds, bonds are broken. So when you break apart a glucose molecule, which we're going to see, um, you're going to be able to extract the um, energy from this um, that's stored in the chemical bonds. Um, energy stored in food is expressed in calories. So a calorie with capital C is the amount of energy needed to raise the temperature one gram of or the, the temperature of one gram of water by one degree Celsius. So a thousand calories is a kilocalorie, or what we refer to as a calorie with a capital C. Cells use all sorts of molecules for food, including fats, proteins, and carbohydrates. Um, the energy stored in each of these molecules varies because of their chemical structures, or like the number of bonds they have. Therefore, their energy storing bonds differ. Cells break down food molecules gradually and use the energy stored in the chemical bonds to produce compounds, such as ATP, that power the activities of the cell. So this is a gradual process, breaking down um, the food mo molecules. If oxygen is available, organisms can obtain energy from food by a process called cellular respiration. The summary of the cellular respiration is below. So um, the reaction is six molecules of oxygen react with one molecule of glucose to produce six molecules of carbon dioxide and six molecules of water. Um, so think about when you breathe in, you breathe in oxygen. When you breathe out, you breathe out carbon dioxide and water vapor. Um, you also produce energy here. So if you notice this reaction, it's the exact opposite of photosynthesis. Um, so they are opposite reactions. Um, so the cell has to release the chemical energy in food molecules, like glucose, gradually. Otherwise, most of the energy would be lost in the form of heat and light. So um, this is known as a, um, when you'll see in chemistry next year, a combustion reaction, a hydrocarbon reacting with oxygen to make carbon dioxide water. Um, combustion reactions are things when you light things on fire. So your cells obviously have to do this under a very gradual process. So cellular respiration is a very controlled combustion reaction. Um, if it wasn't controlled, again, you would lose all the energy in the form of heat and light. So all eukaryotic organisms, so hence not anaerobic bacteria, carry out cellular respiration when oxygen is present. So anaerobic means without um, oxygen, which will be seen later on in the lecture. So the stages of cellular respiration include glycolysis, first, Krebs cycle, second, and then the electron transport chain. So we're going to talk about all three. So first of all, is glycolysis. Glycolysis produces only a small amount of energy. Most of the glucose, glucose's energy, about 90% of it, remains locked in the chemical bonds of um, a molecule called pyruvic acid at the end of glycolysis. So in glycolysis, again, it's the first stage of cellular respiration, and it happens in the cytoplasm of the cell. Um, during glycoly glycolysis, glycolysis means, um, like glycos, referring to the glucose, lysis means to break, so it's splitting glucose. Okay, so glucose is broken down, here's your glucose, into these two pyruvic acids. Each one has three carbons, so here's one pyruvic acid, and here's the other one. Um, so two molecules of three carbon molecules three carbon molecule called pyruvic acid. Um, pyruvic acid then is the reactant for the next cycle that we'll talk or the next part called Krebs cycle, which is the next stage of cellular respiration. So here we go, two pyruvic acids going into the Krebs cycle, the next step of cellular respiration. All the products of glycolysis include pyruvic acid. Um, so here's the pyruvic acid. We make some ATP and then um, NAD DH. So for ATP production glycolysis, the cell deposits two ATP to get glycolysis going. So here's the two ATP going in, um, convert to ADP. Then glycolysis produces four total ATP molecules. So uh, you, you end up getting a net of two ATP molecules at the end because you put in two, you made four, so you really just gained two ATP from that process. The advantages of glycolysis, glycolysis, glycolysis produces ATP very fast, which is an advantage when the energy demands of a cell suddenly increases. 
Glycolysis, again, does not require oxygen, so it can quickly supply energy to cells when oxygen is unavailable. So since it doesn't require energy, we call this an anaerobic process. It does not directly require oxygen, nor does it rely on an oxygen requiring process to run. However, it is still considered part of the cellular respiration process. Um, so glycolysis takes place, again, in the cytoplasm of a cell. So oxygen and energy, so pathways of cellular respiration that require oxygen are called aerobic. So like think about aerobic exercise. Um, the Krebs cycle and the electron transfer chain, the last, the two other um, parts of cellular respiration are both aerobic processes. So um, they both need oxygen to happen. Um, and both these processes happen with, inside the mitochondria. So here's your mitochondria. So the second stage of Krebs, um, cellular respiration Krebs cycle, um, during Krebs cycle, a little more energy is generated from the pyruvic acid that was the product of the glycolysis part. So pyruvic acid from glycolysis enters the matrix, which is the innermost, here we go, innermost compartment of the mitochondrion. The Krebs cycle is also known as the citric acid cycle because citric acid is the first compound formed in the series of reactions. So each molecule of glucose results in two molecules of pyruvic acid, again, from glycolysis, which enter the Krebs cycle. So each molecule of glucose results in two complete turns of the Krebs cycle, one turn per pyruvic acid. Therefore, in the Krebs cycle, for each glucose molecule that goes in, once you go through this whole reaction here, you make the following. You make six car um, carbon dioxide molecules, two AT molecules, ATP molecules, eight NADH molecules, and two FADH molecules. So those are all the um, products of the Krebs cycle part of cellular respiration. The third stage is called electron transport chain. The electron transport chain produces the bulk of the energy in the cellular respiration process by using oxygen, um, which is again a powerful electron acceptor. NADH and FADH2, which again are known as electron carriers, pass the high energy electrons to electron carrier proteins like right here. Okay, so here's your NADH, FADH2. Um, um, they drop off the um, electrons um, to electron carrier proteins in the electron transport chain. At the end of the electron transport chain, the electrons combine with hydrogen ions and oxygen to form water. So oxygen is the final acceptor of hydrogen ions and electrons in aerobic cellular respiration. This is why, again, oxygen is a reactant for cellular respiration. Um, so it's one of the things going into the reaction and why water is a product of cellular respiration. So here's the reaction, 6O2 going in, 6 water is coming out. Energy generated by the electron transfer chain is used to move hydrogen ions against a concentration gradient across the inner mitochondrial membrane and into the intermembrane space. Hydrogen ions pass back across the mitochondrial membrane through the ATP synthase and this causes ATP synthase, this enzyme molecule, to spin. With each rotation, the ATP synthase attaches a phosphate to ADP to, AT, to produce ATP. So this is the step of cellular respiration where most of the ADP molecules are converted to ATP molecules. So this is where you're going to get most of the ATP made um, during cellular respiration. So your energy totals here. In the presence of oxygen, the complete breakdown of one glucose molecule um, through cellular respiration is going to get you to a total of 36 ATP molecules between um, all three stages. So two ATP from glycolysis, two Krebs from the Krebs cycle, and then 32 from the electron transfer chain, which get you to 36. Um, so this represents actually about only 36% of the total energy glucose is bringing in. The remaining 64% of the energy from glucose is actually released as heat that is lost from the organism. So this is just due to inefficiency, why 100% of the glucose's energy is not converted to ATP. This inefficiency is just due to the second law of thermodynamics, which is just the idea of the transfer of energy is never going to be 100% efficient. So everything that runs doesn't usually run 100% efficient, like your car. Um, the gasoline you put in your car, you're not going to get all the energy extracted from the gas. Some of that gets lost as heat, um, which if you've ever felt a car after it's been running, you feel like it's pretty warm. So the cell can generate ATP from just about any source, even though we've modeled just using glucose. Complex carbohydrates are broken down into simple sugars like glucose. 
lipids and proteins can be broken down into molecules that enter the Krebs cycle or glycolysis at one or several places. Okay, so let's look at fermentation here. Fermentation is a process by which energy can be released from food molecules in the absence of oxygen. So ox when you do cellular respiration, you need oxygen. Fermentation is what happens if you actually don't have enough oxygen. Um, so fermentation occurs in the cytoplasm of cells. Um, so under anaerobic conditions, again, no oxygen, fermentation follows um, glycolysis because you don't need oxygen for glycolysis. During fermentation, cells convert NADH produced by glycolysis back to the electron carrier NAD, which allows glycolysis to continue producing ATP. So this regeneration of NAD um, allows glycolysis to continue cyclically. All right, so one type of fermentation is alcoholic fermentation. Yeast and a few other microorganisms use alcoholic fermentation that produces ethyl alcohol and carbon dioxide, so two products, main products there. This process is used to produce alcoholic beverages and actually um, causes bread dough to rise. So the little like bubbles you see in bread dough is actually carbon dioxide um, was left over from the carbon dioxide bubbles. So the chemical equation for alcoholic fermentation, you have pyruvic acid and NADH reacting and to produce um, alcohol, CO2, and NAD. Lactic acid fermentation is the other type. Um, most organisms, including humans, carry out um, fermentation using a chemical reaction that converts pyruvic acid to lactic acid. An example, um, the main method of producing yogurt is through lactic acid fermentation. So think like lact, anything with lact is like, you can, like dairy, um, even though like other organisms do it. Um, <clears throat> lactic acid fermentation of milk with harmless bacteria. So the chemical equation here, pyruvic acid and NADH react to make lactic acid and NAD. So we do not have any carbon dioxide being produced during lactic acid fermentation. So cells normally contain small amounts of ATP produced during cellular respiration, enough for a few seconds of intense activity. So lactic acid fermentation can supply enough ATP to last about 90 seconds. However, extra oxygen is required to get rid of the lactic acid produced. Um, so following an intense workout, a person will like huff and puff, kind of get breathing in and out really heavily for several minutes in order to pay back the buildup of quote unquote the oxygen debt, so the lack of oxygen, and clear the lactic acid from the body. So that's what kind of makes your muscles burn during a workout is this lactic acid buildup. For intense exercising longer than 90 seconds, cellular respiration is required to continue production of ATP. Um, cellular respiration releases energy more slowly than fermentation does, so the body stores energy in the form of the carbohydrate glycogen. Um, so these is enough for 15 to 20 minutes of a workout. So after that, the body begins to break down other stored molecules, including fats, for energy. Um, hibernating animals like the brown bear rely on stored fat for energy when they sleep through the winter. Compared photosynthesis and cellular respiration, photosynthesis and cellular respiration are opposite processes. So the energy flows in opposite directions. Photosynthesis deposits energy, while cellular respiration actually like uses it or withdraws it. The reactions of cellular respiration and the products of photosynthesis, um, or the reactions of cellular respiration, respiration are the products of photosynthesis and vice versa. So we saw that um, earlier, but yeah, this is a little nice diagram of seeing the um, opposite effect. Um, the release of energy by cellular respiration takes place in plants. So a lot of kids kind of People forget that. So some students forget that plants also undergo cellular respiration. Animals do, fungi, protists, and most bacteria. Now energy capture by photosynthesis only occurs in things like plants, algae, and some bacteria. Okay, so that is it. So again, um, if you need to go back and re-read something or re-listen to something, by all means do so. Again, I kind of put really key things in red um, just to kind of pinpoint the main points because I know there's lots of um, um, details thrown in here for cellular respiration, but the, like the main, main, big, big points that you'll want to definitely want to kind of read over or know are the things that are in red. Okay, thanks.